Iraq is struggling to cope with drought. According to officials, some 1,200 people have been forced out of southern marsh. Including water scarcity and desertification. And due to the ongoing drought in the country, the year 2022 has been one of the driest years that Iraq has seen since 19... Terrible events are taking place on the Euphrates River. And scientists have discovered the explanation in a recent study undertaken by an international team. They discovered something that has the potential to alter our perception of this historic river permanently. The Euphrates appears to be heading for a gloomy future if we do not act quickly. What did scientists find? Why did it shock the world? In this episode, we will explain more information. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment below, and share this video with your friends. And let's get started. Why is the Euphrates drying up? What causes the Euphrates River to dry up? Why has the Euphrates River remained dry for so many years? There are numerous reasons for this, including dams, droughts, water policy, and water waste. Many Iraqi people that rely on the river are anxious for water. Low rainfall is the primary cause of the Euphrates River's drying up. Iraq is experiencing the worst drought it has ever seen. Iraq and its surrounding areas are also dealing with climate change and rising temperatures, which exacerbate droughts. This has been a problem for a long time. When the river dries up, it affects over 7 million people. Crops are failing due to a lack of rain, high temperatures, and a dry river. This has forced over 800 families to evacuate the villages around the Euphrates River. Another biblical river, the Tigris, is likewise losing water and drying up. But we will talk about the Tigris River in another video. Okay, back to Euphrates River. What was the Euphrates River like during its peak? Although the world hasn't paid much attention to the Euphrates River in recent years, it is one of the primary reasons why human civilization has progressed to its current state. The Euphrates River was originally the Roman Empire's eastern border and a major section of the Silk Road, a trading route connecting Europe to China, India, and other parts of Asia. It enabled merchants to convey products, rare spices, and valuable items over long distances while also ensuring travelers' safety. This has made it a vital component of global trade for millennia. What was found under Euphrates? According to Mandaean scriptures, the Euphrates River is regarded as the earthly counterpart of the Yardna, a celestial river flowing in heaven. The ancient cities of Babylon, Ur, and Nineveh were situated along the Euphrates in the region known today as Mesopotamia. The river played a crucial role in the development of human civilization in this area. Throughout history, the Euphrates has also served as a natural boundary between various governments and empires, making it a strategically significant and often contested region. The Bible references the Euphrates River numerous times in both the Old and New Testaments. It is often portrayed as a vital landmark, symbolizing the power and grandeur of ancient empires. In the Old Testament, the Garden of Eden and the birthplace of humanity are associated with the Euphrates, which is one of the four rivers said to flow from Eden. Additionally, because the river marked the boundary of the land promised to the Israelites, they were forbidden from crossing it. The discovery of a statue of Gilgamesh represents a pivotal moment in the study of Mesopotamian history and mythology. Gilgamesh, a prominent figure in ancient Near Eastern literature, is well known through various texts. The New Testament mentions the Euphrates as one of the places where the kings of the East will gather their armies before the Battle of Armageddon. Revelation also predicts the rivers drying up, enabling the kingdoms of the East to cross it unimpeded. References to Gilgamesh outside of cuneiform texts are rare. However, the flood story from the Gilgamesh epic discovered by George Smith over a century ago continues to highlight the connections between the Hebrew Bible and Mesopotamian narratives. This flood tale is not the only link between these ancient literatures. A manuscript from the Dead Sea Scrolls, known as the Book of Giants, may also reference Gilgamesh. As the protagonist of one of the world's oldest epics, Gilgamesh can be seen as the precursor to all subsequent heroic figures. Exploring the past to inspire connections and contrast within the Hebrew Bible, Archaeologists working in Iraq in 2003 
suggested they might have discovered the lost tomb of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, the ruler of the ancient Sumerian city of Uruk, is the protagonist of the earliest documented story in human history. This story, known as the Epic of Gilgamesh, was inscribed on clay tablets in the Sumerian language around the middle of the 27th century BC, in the third millennium BC. The narrative commemorates the life of the ruler of Uruk, one of the oldest, most powerful, and longest lasting cities in the region. Some even speculate that the modern nation of Iraq derives its name from this ancient city, though this claim is debated. The Epic of Gilgamesh details Gilgamesh's quest for immortality and his encounters with various mythical creatures. In 2003, a German-led expedition announced the discovery of what they believed to be the entire city of Uruk, including the final resting place of its legendary ruler. This site would have originally been surrounded by the waters of the Euphrates before the river altered its course. George Fassbender, head of the Bavarian Department of Historical Monuments in Munich, remarked, I don't want to say definitively that it was the grave of Gilgamesh, but it looks very similar to that described in the epic. According to the epic, Gilgamesh was entombed beneath the Euphrates in a grave constructed after the river's waters divided following his death. This story was preserved on inscribed clay tablets. Fassbender explained, We found, just outside the city, an area in the middle of the former Euphrates River, the remains of a building that could be interpreted as a burial site. He highlighted that the remarkable discovery of the ancient city buried beneath the Iraqi desert sands was made possible by technological advancements. Fassbender continued, One can look into the ground by analyzing variations in the magnetization of the soil. The differentiation visible in the Euphrates between the mud bricks and the sediments provides a very detailed structure. Venice in the sands of time. The most astonishing finding, according to Fassbender, was the structures already depicted in the Gilgamesh epic. We traversed an area greater than 100 hectares. We discovered garden structures and field structures that match those described in the epic, as well as Babylonian dwellings, he said. He added, the most surprising discovery was an extremely complex network of canals. It is very clear that flooding destroyed some of the dwellings since we can see structures in the canals indicating this. This suggests a highly developed system once existed here. It was like Venice, but in the middle of the desert. There is a story about finding gold in the Euphrates River. I wonder if you have heard it. We bet it will be hot. We will tell you the tale of the Golden Mountain. Long ago, a group of treasure hunters held a firm belief in an age-old myth about golden mountains concealed within the Euphrates River. Despite their extensive and exhaustive search for this legendary treasure, their efforts always ended in disappointment. One fateful day, while exploring a secluded part of the river, they stumbled upon a small cave that descended deep into the earth. The prospect of finally uncovering the treasure spurred them on, and they ventured inside, their lanterns casting eerie shadows along the cave walls. As they delved deeper into the cave, a glimmer caught their eye in the distance. Drawing closer, they could hardly believe their eyes. They had discovered a vast chamber, glittering with gold. The walls sparkled with precious jewels, and the floor was scattered with coins and artifacts of unimaginable value. The treasure hunters were overwhelmed with excitement, their hands trembling with anticipation as they began to collect the treasure. However, their joy was short-lived as the roof started to shake and rocks began to fall from the ceiling. Realizing the peril they were in, the treasure hunters hastily gathered as much gold as they could carry and dashed towards the cave entrance. As they exited the cave, a thunderous roar echoed behind them. The entire cavern collapsed. Though they were safe, they knew how close they had come to losing their lives in their pursuit of the fabled Golden Mountains. From that day forward, the treasure hunters learned a profound lesson, that greed and an insatiable thirst for wealth could lead to great danger. They came to understand that true value lay not in material riches, but in the experiences and relationships shared with others. Although they never found the legendary Golden Mountains, the treasure hunters found contentment in their discovery of something far more valuable the significance of friendship, loyalty, and the joy of life's journey. What do you think about this story? Leave a comment below to let us know what you think. Now let's compare the rivers together. 
Is Euphrates or Tigris wide from bank to another like River Nile? The Euphrates and Tigris rivers are not as wide from bank to bank as the Nile River. The width of a river can vary along its course, but generally speaking, the Nile River is wider than both the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. The Nile is one of the longest rivers in the world and has a larger average width compared to the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. However, it's worth noting that river widths can vary depending on the location and specific stretch of the river. In general, are there rivers in the world their widths similar to river Nile width? The width of rivers can vary significantly around the world. While there are certainly rivers that can rival the width of the Nile River in certain areas, it's important to note that the Nile is one of the widest rivers on average. Some examples of rivers that can have considerable widths in certain areas include Amazon River, the Amazon River, located in South America, is the widest river in the world by volume and can reach widths of up to 6.8 miles, 11 kilometers, during the rainy season. Brahmaputra River. The Brahmaputra River, flowing through India, Bangladesh, and China, can also have considerable widths in certain stretches, although it varies along its course. Mississippi River. The Mississippi River in the United States is another example of a river that can have significant width particularly in its lower reaches, where it can reach widths of over a mile. Yangtze River. The Yangtze River in China, one of the longest rivers in the world, can also have wide sections, especially in its lower course near its mouth. It's important to remember that river widths can vary depending on the location and specific stretch of the river. And these examples represent some of the rivers that can have considerable widths in certain areas. The Jordan River and Euphrates River, the complementarity between the drying up of the Jordan rivers and the Euphrates River and other natural resources is a complex issue with significant regional and global implications. Here are some key points to consider. Water scarcity. The Jordan River and the Euphrates River are vital sources of fresh water in the Middle East. The drying up or reduced flow of these rivers can exacerbate water scarcity in the region, impacting agriculture, drinking water supply, and ecosystems. Agriculture. Both rivers have been historically crucial for irrigation in the region, supporting agriculture. Reduced water availability can lead to decreased agricultural productivity, potentially affecting food security. Ecosystems. These rivers and their associated wetlands are important for biodiversity and provide habitat for various species. Drying up can lead to habitat loss and harm to ecosystems regional conflicts. The management and allocation of water resources in the region have been a source of tension and conflicts among neighboring countries. Reduced water availability can exacerbate these conflicts. Migration and displacement. Water scarcity can lead to population displacement as people migrate in search of water and resources, potentially contributing to social and political instability. Hydropower and energy production. Both rivers have been used for hydropower generation. Reduced river flow can impact energy production. Global impact. The Middle East water issues are not isolated. They can have broader global implications. Water scarcity can lead to increased competition for resources and migration patterns that may affect neighboring regions and countries. Efforts to address the drying up of these rivers and ensure sustainable water management are crucial. This can involve regional cooperation, conservation efforts, sustainable agriculture practices, and the development of alternative water sources. International organizations and agreements may also play a role in addressing these challenges. The second coming of God. What is the rapture? Pop culture references like the Left Behind series paint a picture of a sudden apocalyptic reality where people all over the world vanish. Planes crash because their pilots are gone. Little kids can't find their moms. And if you are one of those left behind, then you can be sure that something even worse is coming for you. The rapture is a future event when Jesus returns to gather all Christians who believe in him and take them to heaven. Then, after seven years, he will come back again and establish his millennial kingdom. During that seven years, those who were not taken away by Jesus will suffer tribulations, hardship, and trials as punishment for their sins. To tip my hand, this is not a theological perspective I subscribe to, mainly because I don't think it can be found in the Bible. I don't believe the rapture is real. So why talk about it? How the end affects your present. Your view of the end times matters. Why? 
Because what you believe about the end of the story impacts how you live right now. If you think the earth and its non-Christian inhabitants are destined only for trials and tribulations, you won't have any reason to invest in earthly things. There's no point in saving for retirement or recycling to reduce the use of non-renewable resources or being employed as anything other than a missionary. In the end, it's all destined for the tribulation dumpster fire. Rapture theology trains people to not care about the world around them, but that's not what Jesus taught. In his great prayer, Jesus didn't pray, take me heaven on your rapture train. Instead, he prayed for God's kingdom to come down to earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Why people think the rapture is real, those who believe in the rapture do so because it's what they've been taught in church. Rapture theology is an American theological innovation. Before 200 years ago, no one would have understood it. Since then, it's been popularized by reference Bibles, movies, and books. It's easy to take it for granted as biblical truth, even though it's nowhere in the Bible. Of course, some people will contend that it is. Let's look at two passages that people turn to in order to prove that the rapture is real. What do you think, Matthew 24? As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Matthew 24, 37, 21. According to rapture theology, you want to be like the people taken away, not the people left behind. Unfortunately, this reads the story backward. Jesus is comparing his return to the days of Noah. You know who you didn't want to be in the days of Noah, the people who were taken away by the raging floodwaters. As Jesus said, they didn't know what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Do you know who you should want to be? The people left behind after the flood, like Noah and his family. Jesus isn't talking about a rapture. He's talking about the final judgment. And at that time, it's good to be left behind. Learn more from Patrick about how Matthew 24 applies to your life. How to follow Jesus in 2023. Vertical bar, New Testament vertical bar, Matthew 24. 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. This is the classic rapture passage. If you already have rapture theology in your head, you're probably thinking, see, you just proved the point, rapture. But that's a case of confirmation bias. If you didn't already believe in a rapture, you'd never conclude that this passage is describing Jesus coming down to take people back to heaven. Why not? Because in this passage, Jesus comes down and he doesn't go back up again. Absolutely nothing in the passage says that Jesus is going back to heaven. A common objection is to ask, what about the people who are meeting with the Lord in the air? Aren't they going to heaven? No, in the Bible, the air is never synonymous with heaven. In this case, the air is halfway between heaven, where Jesus started, and earth, where Jesus is going. This would have made sense to Paul's original audience because they understood how cities were supposed to greet incoming kings. In Rome, when emperors approached a city, crowds would leave the city, meet the king outside the gates, and then usher him back in. The Bible actually shows this. When Jesus comes to Jerusalem as a king on Palm Sunday, people leave Jerusalem to greet him and usher him into the city. The believers in this passage aren't going to heaven. They're meeting Jesus halfway between heaven and earth, in the air, to usher Jesus to earth in a victorious procession. Jesus isn't SpaceX ship landing briefly from the skies, only to take off again. He's a king coming to execute his final judgment on the living and the dead. Belief in the rapture can make life harder. One problem with rapture theology is that it implies that good Christians escape tribulations in this world. This is why Jesus raptures believers, to protect them from future hardship. 
This is pretty much the opposite of what the Bible says. Jesus taught that in this world, we will always have trouble, John 16, 33. And Paul says that we enter into the kingdom of God through the tribulations of this world, Acts 14, 22. If Christians are misled into believing that God will keep them from the hard times of this life, they won't be equipped to follow God when the hard times come. Some Christians are surprised and shaken when tribulations hit. They wonder, why is God letting this happen to me? As though their suffering undermines the truth of God's goodness and sovereignty. But Jesus says that God's kingdom comes to earth when Christians experience hardship and persecution, but respond with faith, trust, and love. When we endure tribulations this way, we show the watching world that our hope is in something bigger, better, and more powerful than the worst trials this world can throw at us. All commentary notes adapted from the ESV Study Bible. 1. Matthew 24, 36, 44. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Read more. In response to the disciples asking, when will these things be? Matt 24, 3. Jesus says no one knows, not even the Son, but the Father only. In his incarnate life, Jesus learned things as other human beings learned them. CFF Luke 2.52, Hebron 5, 8. On the other hand, Jesus was also fully God, and as God, he had infinite knowledge. CF John 2.25, 16.30, 21.17. Here he is apparently speaking in terms of his human nature. This is similar to other statements about Jesus, which could be true of his human nature only, and not of his divine nature. He grew and became strong, Luke 2, 40. Increased in stature, Luke 2, 52. Was about 30 years old, Luke 3, 23. Was weary, John 4, 6. Was thirsty, John 19, 28. Was hungry, Matt. 4, 2 was crucified, 1 Cor 2, 8. Taking account of these verses, together with many verses that affirm Christ's deity, the Council of Chalcedon in AD 451 affirmed that Christ was perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. Yet it also affirmed that Jesus was one person and one subsistence. With regard to the properties of his human nature and his divine nature, the Chalcedonian Creed affirmed that Christ was to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved. That meant the properties of deity and the properties of humanity were both preserved. How Jesus could have limited knowledge and yet know all things is difficult, and much remains a mystery for nobody else has ever been both God and man. One possibility is that Jesus regularly lived on the basis of his human knowledge, but could at any time call to mind anything from his infinite knowledge. Taken, left. The description may indicate that one is taken away to final judgment, CFL Matt 24, 39, while the other remains to experience salvation at Christ's return. Or possibly the one who is taken is among the elect that the Son of Man will gather Tainu from the four winds. Matt 24, 31. 2. Luke 21, 25, 28. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. 
Read more. Jesus foretells the coming of the Son of Man. Having warned of the approaching destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Luke 21, 524, Jesus turns now to the more distant future and foretells his second coming, the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus turns next to teachings about the consummation of all things and his return, signs in sun and moon and stars. The powers of the heavens will be shaken describes great changes in the skies. They will see. The second coming involves the visible return of the Son of Man from heaven, Acts 1.11, bringing history to its end. These things take place refers to Luke 21, 25, 27. Straighten up and raise your heads. A posture of hope and confidence. Redemption refers to the time of Christ's return when mortality puts on immortality, 1 Corber 1553, and the redemption of the body takes place, Romer 823. 3. John 5, 28, 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Read more. Jesus reaffirms the resurrection on the last day. C.F. Dan. 12. 2. Those who have done good, those who have done evil, does not imply that people's deeds in this life are the basis on which judgment is pronounced for that would contradict John's strong emphasis on belief in Jesus as the way to gain eternal life. See John 3.16, 5.24.25, etc. Instead, good works function as evidence of true faith, and if good works are lacking, they show an absence of true faith. All those who truly believe will be brought from death to life, John 5.24, and as a consequence will do good and will therefore enjoy the resurrection of life. 4. 1. Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Read more. Cry of command, voice of an archangel, trumpet of God, the three noises summon the dead to wake from their slumber. The only archangel identified in the Bible is Michael, Jude 9. Trumpets in the OT proclaim the Lord's presence, X 19.16, 1 Cron, 16, 6, Ps, 47, 5, Joel 2, 1, Zech, 9.14. In Jewish tradition, the trumpet was associated with battle, the day of the Lord, and the resurrection. CF 1 Cor 1552. First, then, dead Christians rise from their graves to the realm of the living, and then the living and the dead together are caught up from the earth into the air to meet Christ. The Greek for caught up, harpazo, to grab or seize suddenly, to snatch, take away, gives a sense of being forcibly and suddenly lifted upward. See John 615, Acts 839, together with the dead Christians would suffer no disadvantage. CF, we who are alive will not proceed. 1 Thess 4.15 Clouds Probably not earthly rain clouds, but the clouds of glory that surround the presence of God. CL X 13.21 33 9.10 40 38, Num 12 5 1 Kings 8.10.11 Ps 97 2 Dan 7.13, Matt, 17.5, Mark 13.26, Acts 1.9, Reverend 14.14. 14. To meet. The Greek term apontesis is often used of an important dignitary's reception by the inhabitants of a city who come out to greet and welcome their honored guest with fanfare and celebration, then accompany him into the city, CF. Matt 25.6, Acts 28.15, a related term, hypantesis, is used in Matt 25, 1, John 12, 13. It may indicate that the subsequent movement of the saints after meeting Christ in the air conforms to Christ's direction, thus in a downward motion toward the earth. However, some interpreters caution that the vivid symbolism of apocalyptic language must be kept in mind to avoid over-interpretation of the apocalyptic details. In the air, the sky. 5. 
Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. Read more. Announcement of the coming king. Coming with the clouds. Jesus will come as the Son of Man with universal dominion. See if I have Dan. 7, 13, 14. Though his subjects pierced him. Zesh 12, 10. Wail. Most scholars think the wailing is a reaction to judgment instead of the kind of grief that leads to salvation. The coming one is the Lord God, Alpha and Omega, first and last letters of the GCO alphabet. See Reverend 117, 22, 13. Jesus is the beginning of all history, the creator, and also the goal for whom all things are made. All history is moving toward glorifying him. 6. Hebrews 9, 27, 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Read more. Appointed to die once. Every person has but a single life before eternal judgment. This repudiates reincarnation and any idea that there will be a second chance to believe after death since immediately after the reference to the fact of death comes the phrase, and after that comes judgment, with no hint of any intervening opportunity for change of status. The final judgment will take place when Christ comes again. He died once as an offering for the sins of many, and he will appear a second time in judgment when he will save his followers, those who are eagerly waiting for him. This clear anticipation of Christ's return, see Hebel 1025, C. Wef, Rom, 819, Rom, 823, Rom, 825, 1 Cor, 1 7, Gal, 5 5, Phil, 320, calls all who hope for salvation to expectant perseverance. 7. Matthew 24, 26, 31. So if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Read more. Look, he is in the wilderness. Look, he is in the inner rooms. The Messiah will not come secretly to a select group and stay hidden from public view. Rather, he will appear like a flash of lightning, sudden and visible to all. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. It seems best not to overinterpret this striking proverbial expression. It probably means simply that, just as people from far away can see vultures circling high in the air, Christ's return in judgment will be visible and predictable. A similar view is that the vultures suggest the widespread death that will accompany the return of Christ to judge those who have rejected his kingdom. In either case, it will be impossible for people not to see and recognize the return of Christ. Sun, moon, stars, powers. It is possible that this is entirely literal language, with stars perhaps referring to a large meteor shower. Others take it as a mixture of literal and figurative language, and still others take it as entirely figurative, pointing to political judgment on nations and governments. The argument in favor of a figurative interpretation is that this verse echoes possibly figurative language about heavenly disturbances in the OT prophets, such as Isa, 1310, 34, 4, Azek, 32, 7, Joel, 210, and Amos 8, 9. Those arguing for a literal interpretation point to biblical accounts of actual darkness. CF, X1021, 23 and Matt, 2745. The idea of the stars falling and the heavens being rolled up is mentioned elsewhere in the NT as well. See Heb 112, 2 Pet, 3, 7, 
10, 12, Reverend 613, 14. Whether these events are to be understood as being primarily literal or primarily figurative, it is clear that these will be earth-shattering events through which all creation will be radically transformed at the return of Christ. Regarding the new heavens and the new earth, see Isa, 65, 17, 2 Pet, 313, Reverend 21, 1, Sign of the Son of Man. Some suggest that this is a type of heavenly standard or banner that unfurls in the heavens as Christ returns in power and great glory, while others understand it to be the arrival of the Son of Man himself as the sign of the end time consummation of the age. CF Matt 1627, Matt 26, 64. Mourn. Either a sorrow that produces repentance or a great sadness of regret in light of coming judgment. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. This most clearly is end time language that recalls Daniel's prophecy, Dan 7, 13, 14, and points to Jesus' return at the end of the age. CF of 2 Thess 1, 7, 10, Reverend 19, 11, 16. With power and great glory, Christ will be revealed as the eternal ruler of the kingdom of God designated by the Ancient of Days to receive worship and to exercise dominion over the earth and all of its inhabitants. CF Dan 713.14 The return of Christ is a literal event in which Christ will come in the same way that the disciples saw him go into heaven, Acts 1.11. A trumpet call is associated in Jewish end-time thought. Isa 18.3, Isa 27.13, and also in Christian writings. 1 Corpor 1551, 52, 1 Thess 416, with the appearance of the Messiah. His angels um, will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The involvement of angels probably indicates that when Jesus returns, he will not only gather to himself all believers alive on the earth, but will also bring with him all the redeemed who are in heaven. See at 1 Thess 414, Reverend 1911 to 16. 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, 3. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Read more. These verses are closely linked to 1 Thess. 4, 13, 18. Both offer reassurance concerning the fate of Christians at the Second Coming, and 1 Thess 5, 9, 10 alludes back to 1 Thess 4, 13, or 18. It seems that the Thessalonians either were worried that they might not be prepared for the day of the Lord, or were insecure about their status on that day in view of the recent unexpected deaths. Now concerning, Paul may be responding to a question from the Thessalonians, communicated by Timothy, the times and the seasons, that is, when the day of the Lord will occur. CF Acts 1 7. The Thessalonians' question likely arose more from anxiety than idle curiosity, since Paul's answer reassures rather than rebukes them and seems concerned with both the how and the when of the day of the Lord. You have no need to have anything written to you. In spite of what the Thessalonians apparently think, there is no real need for Paul to write them on this matter. The phrase day of the Lord is common in the OT prophets. See note on Amos 5:18:20. It refers to the great and terrible day when Yahweh will intervene to punish the disobedient. For example, Isa 13, 6, 16, Joel 1, 13, 15, 2, 1, 11, Obad 15, 20, Mal 4, 5, and to save the faithful, for example, Isa 27, 2, 13, Jer 38, 9, Joel 2, 31, 32, Obad 21. In Paul's letters, it is equated with the second coming, like a thief in the night. Throughout the NT, the thief simile suggests unexpectedness and unwelcomeness. Matt 24, 43, 44, Luke 12, 39, 40, 2 Pet 3, 10, Reverend 3, 3, Reverend 16, 15. The negative aspect is clearly present in 1 Thess 5, 4, and there is no reason to think that it is absent here. However, although some have wondered whether Paul is threatening the Thessalonians with the prospect of final judgment, it seems more likely in view of 1 Thess. 
five, four and one, Thess five, nine, that he is actually reassuring believers who are insecure, perhaps as a result of the recent deaths in their midst. People, that is, unbelievers. Peace and security, possibly an allusion to Imperial Roman propaganda or perhaps more likely to Jer 614 or Gerber 811, where similar language is used of a delusional sense of immunity from divine wrath, labor pains, an analogy referring to the judgment and destruction on the day of the Lord. C.F. Isa, 13.8, Jer 6.24, 9, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. Read more. Mystery. Christians who are alive at the time of the resurrection will be transformed so that their bodies become spiritual and immortal like the bodies of those who are resurrected from the dead. See 1 Thess 4, 13, 18, 10, John 14, 1, 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Read more. Believe in God is translated as an imperative or a command, but the Greek could also be rendered as a statement, you believe in God. The imperative is probably better in light of the previous sentence. What troubles the disciples is Jesus' imminent departure. See 1336. Believe in keeping with OT usage, for example, Isa 2816, denotes personal relational trust. In light of the context, Jesus going to the Father, John 13, 1, 3, John 14, 28, it is best to understand my Father's house as referring to heaven. In keeping with this image, the many rooms or dwelling places, G. Kaismon, are places to live within that large house. The translation rooms is not meant to convey the idea of small spaces, but only to keep consistency in the metaphor of heaven as God's house. In a similar passage, Jesus speaks of his followers being received into the eternal dwellings. Luke 16, 9, See Felwolf 1 Cor 2, 9. All commentary sections adapted from the ESV Study Bible. 1. Matthew 6, 5, 8. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Read more. Prayer was a pillar of Jewish piety. Public prayer, said aloud in the morning, afternoon, and evening, was common. Stand and pray in the synagogues. At the set time of prayer, Pious Jews would stop what they were doing and pray, some discreetly, but others with pretentious display. Jesus did not condemn all public prayer, as indicated by his own prayers in public, for example, Matt 14, 19, 1536. One's internal motivation is the central concern. Shut the door. Though public prayer has value, prayer completely away from public view allows a person or group to focus more exclusively on God. Heap up empty phrases. Pagans repeated the names of their gods or the same words over and over without thinking. CFO 1 Kings 1826, Acts 1934. Jesus is prohibiting mindless mechanical repetition, not the earnest repetition that flows from the imploring heart. Mark 1439, 2 Cor 12 8, CFPs 136, Isa 63, 2 Hebrews 416. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Read more. Draw near, Jika Prosertomai, approach, go to, draw near to, is used consistently in Hebrews to represent a person approaching God. Heb, 725, Hebomar 10, 122, Hebub, 116, 
Heb 1218, 22, CF Kix, 16, 9, 34, 32, Lev 9, 5, Doit 4, 11, which is possible only when one's sins are forgiven through the sacrificial and intercessory ministry of a high priest. Heber 7.25 Heb 10.22 The encouragement to draw near to God's throne implies that Christians have the privilege of a personal relationship with God. Confidence translates Greek peresha, boldness, confidence, courage, especially with reference to speaking before someone of great rank or power. See Aram Muhab 3, 6, Heb 10, 19, 35. It indicates that Christians may come before God and speak plainly and honestly, yet still with appropriate reverence, without fear that they will incur shame or punishment by doing so. Throne of Grace. God the Father with Jesus at His right hand. Heber 8, 1. Heb 12, 2. Sif Heb 1, 8. Graciously dispenses help from heaven to those who need forgiveness and strength in temptation. 3. 1. Thessalonians 5, 16, 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Read more. Rejoice always. Joy in Paul's letters is a basic mark of the Christian, Rom 14, 17, and a fruit of the Spirit, Gal 5, 22. It is often associated with the firm hope of the Christian, for example, Rom 5, 2, 5, 12, 12. Pray without ceasing suggests a mental attitude of prayerfulness, continual personal fellowship with God, and consciousness of being in His presence throughout each day. Christians are to be marked by thanksgiving, EPH 5, 4, 20, Colonel 2, 7, Colonel 3, 15, 17, Colonel 4, 2. This probably refers to all of 1, Thessalonians 5, 16, 18, 4, Philippians 4, 6, 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Read more. Paul echoes Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, see Matt 6, 25, 34, that believers are not to be anxious, but are to entrust themselves into the hands of their loving Heavenly Father, whose peace will guard them in Christ Jesus. Paul's use of guard may reflect his own imprisonment or the status of Philippi as a Roman colony with a military garrison. In either case, it is not Roman soldiers who guard believers. It is the peace of God Almighty. Because God is sovereign and in control, Christians can entrust all their difficulties to Him who rules over all creation and who is wise and loving in all his ways. Romers 8, 31, 39. An attitude of thanksgiving contributes directly to this inward peace. 5. 1. John 5, 14, 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Read more. To ask God according to His will does not mean that, before Christians can pray effectively, they need somehow to discover God's secret plans for the future, sometimes called His hidden will or will of decree, CF door 29, 29. Rather, it means they should ask according to what the Bible teaches about God's will for His people, sometimes called God's revealed will or will of precept. If Christians are praying in accordance with what pleases God as found in the teaching of Scripture, then they are praying according to His will, CFF Matt 610, EPH 517. To know that He hears us in whatever we ask is enough because communion with God is the goal of prayer. We have the requests. Human experience testifies that Christians do not always receive all the things they ask from God, even things that seemingly accord with His revealed will. See note above. This verse must be understood in light of other passages of Scripture, which show that praying according to God's will includes the need to pray in faith, Matt 21, 22, James 1, 6, with patience, Luke 18, 1, 8, in obedience, Ps 66, 18, 1, Pet 3, 12, and in submission to God's greater wisdom, Luke 22, 42, Rom 8, 28, 1, Pet 4, 19. 6. Matthew 6, 9, 13. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Read more. Jesus gives his disciples an example to follow when praying. The prayer has a beginning invocation and six petitions that give proper priorities. The first three petitions focus on the preeminence of God, while the final three focus on personal needs in a community context. Father, G.K. Potter, Father, would have been Abba in Aramaic, the everyday language spoken by Jesus, C.F., Mark 14, 36, Ram 8, 15, Gal 4, 6. It was the word used by Jewish children for their earthly fathers. However, since the term in both Aramaic and Greek was also used by adults to address their fathers, the claim that Abba meant daddy is misleading and runs the risk of irreverence. Nevertheless, the idea of praying to God as our father conveys the authority, warmth, and intimacy of a loving father's care, while in heaven reminds believers of God's sovereign rule over all things. The theme of heavenly father is found throughout the Old Testament. Doit 14.1 32, 6, Ps, 103, 13, Jer 3, 4, 31, 9, Hos 11, 1. Jesus' disciples are invited into the intimacy of God the Son with His Father. The concern of this first petition is that God's name would be hallowed, that God would be treated with the highest honor and set apart as holy. Christians are called to pray and work for the continual advance of God's kingdom on earth. The second petition, see note on Matt 6, 9, 13. The presence of God's kingdom in this age refers to the reign of Christ in the hearts and lives of believers and to the reigning presence of Christ in his body, the church, so that they increasingly reflect his love, obey his laws, honor him, do good for all people, and proclaim the good news of the kingdom. The third petition speaks of God's will. This means God's revealed will See note on EPH 517, which involves conduct that is pleasing to him as revealed in scripture. Just as God's will is perfectly experienced in heaven, Jesus prays that it will be experienced on earth. The will of God will be expressed in its fullness only when God's kingdom comes in its final form, when Christ returns in power and great glory. See Matt 2430, see at Rom 818, 25, Reverend 20, 110, but it will increasingly be seen in this age as well. Matt 1331, 33. The fourth petition focuses on the disciples' daily bread, a necessity of life which by implication includes all of the believer's daily physical needs. Forgive us our debts, the fifth petition, does not mean that believers need to ask daily for justification, since believers are justified forever from the moment of initial saving faith. Rama 5, 1, 9, 8, 1, 10, 10. Rather, this is a prayer for the restoration of personal fellowship with God when fellowship has been hindered by sin. CFE EPH 430. Those who have received such forgiveness are so moved with gratitude toward God that they also eagerly forgive those who are debtors to them. On sin as a debt owed to God, see note on Colossians 2.14. This final sixth petition addresses the disciples' battle with sin and evil. Lead us not into temptation. The word translated temptation, gikosil perasmos, can indicate either temptation or testing. The meaning here most likely carries the sense, allow us to be spared from difficult circumstances that would tempt us to sin, CF Matt 26, 41. Although God never directly tempts believers, James 1, 13, he does sometimes lead them into situations that test them. CF, Matt 4, 1, also Job 1, 1 Pet, 1, 6, 4, 12. In fact, trials and hardships will inevitably come to believers' lives, and believers should count it all joy. James 1, 2, when trials come, for they are strengthened by them. James 1, 3, 4. Nonetheless, believers should never pray to be brought into such situations, but should pray to be delivered from them, for hardship and temptation make obedience more difficult and will sometimes result in sin. 
Believers should pray to be delivered from temptation. See Seth Matt 2641, Luke 22, 40, 46, 2 Pet, 2 9, Reverend 310, and led in paths of righteousness. Ps 23, 3. Deliver us from evil. The phrase translated evil, GK2 Ponaru, can mean either evil or the evil one, namely Satan. The best protection from sin and temptation is to turn to God and to depend on his direction. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen is evidently a later scribal edition, since the most reliable and oldest Greek manuscripts all lack these words, which is the reason why these words are omitted from most modern translations. However, there is nothing theologically incorrect about the wording, CF 1 Crondel 29, 11, 13, nor is it inappropriate to include these words in public prayers. 7 Mark 11, 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Read more. Whatever you ask. God delights to give good things to those who ask Him. Matt 7, 11 and is capable of granting any prayer, though we must ask with godly motives. James 4, 3, and according to God's will, 1 John 5, 14. Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Those who trust God for the right things in the right way can have confidence that God will supply every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Phil 4, 19. Knowing that he will work all things together for good and will graciously give us all things. Romer 8, 28, 32. Some have misused this verse by telling people that if they pray for physical healing or for some other specific request, and if they just have enough faith, then they can have confidence that God has already done or will do whatever they ask. But we must always have the same perspective that Jesus had, that is confidence in God's power, but also submission to his will. Father, all things are possible for you, yet not what I will, but what you will. Mark 14, 36. 8. Ephesians 6, 17, 18. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Read more. Praying. The weapons for warfare are spiritual because they are rooted in prayer, which is the Christian's most powerful resource. Prayer is to permeate believers' lives as a universal practice, as seen by the use of all four times in this verse, at all times, with all prayer, with all perseverance, for all the saints. Prayer in the Spirit is a form of worship. John 4, 23, 24. Enabled by the Spirit of God, who intercedes on behalf of the person who prays, Romers 8, 26, 27. 9, 1 Timothy 2, 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Read more. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Paul turns to expounding in specific terms what true gospel living, 1 Tim 1, 5, should look like. He calls for prayer, and he addresses hindrances to prayer, 1 Tim 2, 115. In describing life that properly emerges from the gospel and so on, word go, Paul first mentions prayer for the salvation of all people. This also leads to a discussion of godly living and appropriate behavior in corporate worship, particularly unity, modesty, and proper submission. Paul's point is not to list all the ways to pray, but to pile up various terms in reference to prayer for their cumulative impact. This is a call for all sorts of prayer for all sorts of people. 10. James 5.16 Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Read more. Confess your sins to one another. Sometimes confession in the community is needed before healing can take place, since sin may be the cause of the illness. CF 1 Cor 11.29.30 Pray for one another is directed to all the readers of James's letter and indicates that he did not expect prayer for healing to be limited to the elders. James 5.14 The righteous will have great power in prayer as God grants their requests. All commentary sections adapted from the ESV Study Bible. 1. Ephesians 1.11 
In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Read more. Making those who believe in him heirs with Christ was not an ad hoc event. God had planned it from all eternity. By definition, God is sovereign, directing all things freely according to his royal counsel. This is in sharp contrast with the pagan gods of the time, who were understood to be often fickle or bound by an inscrutable and arbitrary fate. God's predestination gives his people tremendous comfort, for they know that all who come to Christ do so through God's enabling grace and appointment. EPH 2, 8, 10. Who works all things according to the counsel of his will is best understood to mean that every single event that occurs is in some sense predestined by God. At the same time, Paul emphasizes the importance of human responsibility, as is evident in all of the moral commands later in Ephesians 4, 6 and in all of Paul's letters. God uses human means to fulfill what he has ordained. With regard to tragedies and evil, Paul and the other biblical writers never blame God for them. CF Rom 512, 2 Tim 414, also Job 121, 22. Rather, they see the doctrine of God's sovereignty as a means of comfort and assurance. Sitra Rom 8:28-30. Confident that evil will not triumph and that God's good plans for his people will be fulfilled. How God's sovereignty and human responsibility work together in the world is a mystery no one can fully understand. 2. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Read more. God weaves everything together for good for his children. The good in this context does not refer to earthly comfort, but conformity to Christ. Romers 8:29 closer fellowship with God, bearing good fruit for the kingdom, and final glorification. Rom 8.30 Christians can be assured that all things work together for good. God has always been doing good for them, starting before creation, the distant past, continuing in their conversion, the recent past, and then on to the day of Christ's return, the future. 3. Matthew 10.29.31 are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Read more. Sparrows were customarily thought of as the smallest of creatures, and the penny was one of the least valuable Roman coins. CFR 526. God is sovereign over even the most insignificant events. Since the Heavenly Father gives constant sovereign supervision, even to seemingly insignificant creatures, surely He will also care for His disciples in their mission to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. 4. Colossians 1 16, 17 For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Read more. Christ is Lord of creation. Jesus is the Lord, the maker and upholder of all things in the universe. Jesus did not come into existence when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was the agent of creation through whom God made heaven and earth. John 1, 3, and note, 1 Cor of 8, 6. Jesus cannot be the first thing created, as the ancient Arian heresy claimed, since all things without exception were created by him. Paul is using the current Jewish terms for various rankings of angels, although he doesn't explain their relative ranks. Jesus is not only the agent of creation, but is also the goal of creation, for everything was created by him and for him, that is for his honor and praise. Since Jesus is in this sense the goal of creation, he must be fully God. Christ continually sustains his creation, preventing it from falling into chaos or disintegrating. CO. Heb 1, 3, 5, Isaiah 45, 7, 9. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. 
Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. Read more. The Lord's creative will and wise purposes stand behind everything. Therefore, his people should not be discouraged when the appearances of history seem contrary to his promises. Far from a problem to cope with, God's sovereignty over all things is the only hope for the flowering of salvation and righteousness in this world. Isaiah warns against challenging God's right to do his will in his own way. Putting God under suspicious scrutiny is a serious offense. Created beings may not demand explanations from him. Sia Romdro 9:19:21. 6. Proverbs 16:33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Read more. Casting lots involves the random selection or distribution of objects in order to make a choice uncontrolled and unbiased by the participants. In Israel, it was typically performed before the Lord, see Josh 18.8, in order to receive his direction. Not only the careful plans of the heart, Proverbs 16.1.9, but also the apparently random practice of casting lots falls under God's providential governance. 7. Job 42, 2. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Read more. In his second speech, the Lord asks Job particularly about power in relation to himself and other creatures he has made. 46, 41, 34. Job, directly aware of God as never before, responds by humbly submitting to God's sovereignty and penitently despising himself for his earlier wild words. 42, 1 of 6. While Job had rightly defended himself against his friend's accusations of sin and had defined his circumstances as being governed by God, he had drawn conclusions about what his affliction meant that did not account sufficiently for what was hidden in the knowledge and purposes of God. 8. Lamentations. 337, 39. Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Why should a living man complain, a man, about the punishment of his sins? Read more. Just as in creation, CF General 1, 3, Ps 33, 9, God sovereignly speaks and commands in history and things happen, including Jerusalem's destruction. Lam 1, 5, 12, 16, 2, 1, 10. The God who sent judgment can also send renewal. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next video.